what is food? What are we doing with food? What is it to us? It behooves all of us to ask that question. And I think it really can drive and shape and motivate how we approach food. You know, the intention. The intention and who we're purchasing the food from and the chain, you know, the supply all the way until we're preparing it and the way in which we prepare it, the gratitude that we prepare it with. When you present that, you get into the story of the world. <laughs> you know, you get into the story of what plants eat and what animals eat and what humans eat. That's a really amazing story and I think can draw us into a present conversation that is much richer and less threatening, you know, it becomes less about um, whether someone is eating uh, the best food or whether someone is eating the healthiest food because um, that's not always what food's about. There are so many definitions of what a food system is. It's a word that becomes kind of an easy way of referencing something that's beyond the individual scope, right? It's like, we don't know how to talk about structures. We can say, oh, capitalism, or oh, patriarchy, but we don't really, we don't really have any way of articulating the way those things work very well. Um, and so food system is really nice because people, when they say it, they know they're referencing something that has moving parts. Right? and has multiple ways of affecting your life. And so at the really most mundane level, the food system is what shapes your everyday sustenance. So when we think about the food system, we think about the people that start the seeds, the people that nurture those seeds, transplant those seeds, cultivate them, weed the fields, harvest, package if it's going, uh, you know, depending on what the product is, you know, load it into the truck, drive it to the farmer's market or the distributor or the restaurant the individual that prepares that food, the individual that serves that food, or the individual that sells that food at the counter, the person that, you know, cooks it at home, the people around the table consuming it, uh, the person that's picking up the food that doesn't get consumed, uh, the individuals at the landfills or the compost or the recycling places, that, that's the food system. There's a great line, might have been Levi Strauss, who said food has to be good to think as well as good to eat. Right? And in a sense, what the food system does is help us organize the thinking part, right? How can we think about what we need? How can we um, make sense of it? How can some people be free of the everyday drudgery of doing this? And how can other people, are other people surviving based on how it's organized? Pittsburgh's on the cusp of this wonderful kind of explosion of the food scene where the clientele, the, the community is really getting behind it and the energy to me is everyone is embracing it and so there's a lot of people working together. There's been a sea change in restaurants um, just in diversity, you know, I could not find, you know, decent Asian food you know, in 99. Now we have, you know, Squirrel Hill is a great um, little enclave for like great Asian food. Then if you go to Monroeville, there's great Indian food, you know, so we're getting there. And then, you know, we're starting to see Mexican food coming in, you know, in Brookline and in all those little neighborhoods. So restaurants have really changed.
opened this place uh, March 2013. I'm pretty much a success story here according to my landlord. So today we are cooking uh, curry chicken and rice and cabbage. I use electric pots. It's I'm limited with kitchen space. This is I think the smallest kitchen uh, you'll ever see. I have onions and I'll add some garlic. I'll put some vegetable oil. I like using vegetable oils to cook my food. Um, I really don't use too much measuring. We don't do too much measuring in Africa anyways. The onions are almost brown. Then the next thing we're gonna do is, I already cut up the chicken and washed it. It has, I'm using chicken quarters. You can use any type of chicken you choose. No problem, it take approximately two hours to cook it. It'll be tender, all the flavor will get inside the chicken. So, I like flavor. I like using different ingredients. I, I like tasteful food. I hate bland food. So, I, I put pretty much everything in my food. I love it. It's my passion. It's always been since I was a kid. Uh, we owned a restaurant in Kenya, my dad and my mom. Uh, they also came from a background of cooking where my grandfather was a chef too. And I think it's just like in our blood. Like it just, I just followed. Um, my sister owns a guest house and she cooks there too. So it's a family thing. We enjoy cooking. We enjoy interacting and um, sharing a meal to us. It's, uh, it brings people close together. So I wanted to bring a little bit of Kenyan taste into the Pittsburgh area and hope people embrace it as they have. In the past, local food's been stuff coming out of people's backyards or from neighboring farms. The first generation of immigrants, you know, a lot of them were from the countryside, wherever they came from, whether it was Italy or Slovakia or Germany. Even if they worked in a mill or something, they had farming roots. When I was growing up, we had a little five acre piece of property and we had a big garden, an orchard, you know, strawberries, raspberries, blueberries. We always raised a beef cow for our own meat. And, you know, so many people, even though they didn't have a large plot of land, what land they did have, you know, they used it to raise a lot of their food. And then, you know, over the years, you saw that beginning to change. It just all of a sudden started to become yard. And, you know, just this focus on having this green, perfect yard that actually is the least productive plot of land and one of the most environmentally degrading. When you think about those small engines out there every week cutting that grass. But these days it seems like folks are are trying to reconnect to the source of their food. They're realizing that food traveling great distance is limited in the type of the, the type of food, the varieties of food. It's limited in the nutrition content of it, and it doesn't help the local economy at all. And so people are interested in all three things. They're interested in, in unique flavors. They're interested in the, the nutrition of unique, of unique crops, and they want to have their money directly impact the local economy. We see plants and nature as a commodity. We don't ask that question of what is our connection with plants. And if we ask that question, we'll see that they're really our life force. <laughs> we have to have them to survive. And if we kill them off or we abuse them, we will not thrive. I do still believe not everybody's gonna farm, right? You know, we're not gonna get everybody back in the kitchen and nor does everybody want to or need to. But to understand how your food's grown, to understand where it's coming from, to understand what to do with it or what can be done with it, those are like basic social, societal values and, and skills. And so if you're not necessarily the person who's gonna be doing that, then you wanna know the person who is.
the process starts with milk. And in my case, I'm using raw milk. The true Rebel Show is required to use raw milk and from certain breeds of cows and grass. And you're not allowed to use the name in this country anyway, so I'm not making true Rebel Show, but I'm trying to replicate it to a degree. So we start with milk, heated to about 95 degrees, add a collection of cultures to produce some acidity in the milk, and then some mold cultures that help with the ripening process, and let it sit there for about a half an hour. Add the enzyme rennet, which I'm using a traditional veal rennet, and that's what makes the milk coagulate till you get this solid, turn a liquid into a solid is really what it does. It's an enzymatic reaction. Cut it in pieces. Different cheeses use different sizes of, of cut. Um, this one is a pretty small cut, and then stir it till it sits on the floor and doesn't bounce. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't splat, but doesn't bounce. pour it into the molds, turn it, press it for a few hours, about uh, three to four hours. We'll press it, take the weights off, um, and then let it sit there on the table overnight in a warm room to continue to acidify and drain more of the whey out. By morning, they'll be about an inch or an inch and a half tall. And then salt them, and for about a week, to 10 days, they'll be in a room that's close to 60 degrees and about 95% humidity. And then the temperature will drop to 45 to 50 for the rest of the aging time. Still high humidity. Farming is uh, one of those things that you can do without making a lot of compromises. I mean, you're the only one that suffers. I mean, every other job that you get, you know, you make a little compromise. Are you on message with what your, uh, the company you work for is doing? And, you know, generally it's not 100%, but in farming you can be 100% behind that message. And uh, for me, that message is it's something that every human being needs good, nutritious food. And so for me, from the very get-go, that's been the goal. Then that's what all farming should be about in a, in a nutshell. It's not about making money, it's about feeding ourselves. I mean, that's why farming came about in the first place. I love making things happen on a day-to-day -day basis, like real tangible things that um, benefit a community in a tangible way. I like creating you know, a product that I can stand by and feel good about. It takes a really special person who's willing to swallow the risk. For instance, as a CSA farmer, it's like my job to educate my members and customers here at Farmer's Market about just what it's like for farmers. It's important that they understand the difficulties because they need to feel good about their participation in the local food economy. You know. Because they're participating, a farm is, is being able to stay in business because they're choosing to participate. They know they're having a terrible year. They're going to make sure that their food dollars stay with those farmers to make sure that they live to see the next season. Farming is a very, very difficult lifestyle. It, it, farming is not nine to five. It's not, well, we're off on Christmas and we're off on Thanksgiving. I mean, that, that's not the case. I mean, it, it's, it's 365 days a year. It's sleeping in your bed and hearing that rainstorm come and say, oh God, I hope nothing floods, or I hope this, or I hope that. It's all adaptability. I mean, you have to be, to make this work, you have to be flexible. You know, there's no one way of doing any of this, any of this stuff. If you think you know what you're doing, you need to slap yourself upside the head and said, you know, look again and have a lot of things in your arsenal. Otherwise, you're not going to survive at doing this kind of stuff. 
ultimately I got tired of hearing the negative things about what people thought was going on in Swissville and how it changed. So I kind of was like, well, somebody needs to do something. So I started a, uh, a online group called uh, the Swissville Community Action Committee. And um, from there, I just started, you know, getting people from the community to get involved just to talk about, the, you know, things that are going on, positive things, negative things. I kind of got the sense that there was a new Swissville and the old Swissville, meaning that, you know, there were some of the people who've been in Swissville for like 50, 60, 70 years who were still around. And then there were some people who were just coming in and they're brand new. And those two people, they were like two different worlds. They didn't know each other. They didn't conversate or congregate. So I wanted to kind of create a space where those two worlds could collide and, and you know, kind of get familiar with each other and, you know, just, I guess, be a community again. So I decided, you know, starting a community garden might be, might be a positive way to do that because, you know, everybody usually congregates around food, so. That community that you build, like neighbors helping neighbors, you know, is so valuable. And then when you can take it one step further and all sit down and have a celebration of food that was homegrown, it's, it's just rewarding beyond measure. But I think the secret is not in our homogeneous groups. So that tradition has been handed down. Like I remember my grandmother being in the kitchen and hearing so much of the olden days and what the young kids need to do now, all around the kitchen while they're cooking. You know, grandma's making pound cake and um, cherry cheesecake and <laughs> um, pancakes, you know. So our history being told around the kitchen and including food. I try to have gatherings at my house and I bring everybody who I know and people who I, you know, these are, this is purposeful. If I get to know you a little bit better, then you're not as frightening or you're not as, you know, scary to me. And so then I can actually look beyond your ethnicity or your gender or your sexual orientation and actually see you as a person and actually hear what you have to say. And what you've got to say may be actually very important. For the last, what, 20 or so years, um, there's been more talk about the food system and what what is the food system. This, this whole farm to table discussion and industrial food, right? And know what's in your food and know where it comes from and, and why should we be buying all this processed and goodness knows what food from our industrial food system. Let's, let's kind of go back to the source, the know your farmer type of thing and farmers markets have increased astronomically, the number of them in the country since the 80s, I believe. Community supported agriculture, CSAs, where people are buying a share um, of the farmer's output um, and every week are getting this big box of beautiful, fresh, healthy produce. So we've got farmers markets, CSAs, We've got people choosing to pay a lot of money to go to a farm-to-table dinner at some place, going to restaurants that, that say that they source locally, reading The Omnivore's Dilemma by Michael Pollan and saying, wow, you know, that makes sense. Maybe I'm not going to go out and kill my own boar, but I really want to think about where my food comes and I'm going to, I'm going to vote with my dollars, right? I'm going to go to certain supermarkets. I'm only going to buy fair trade or I, I'm not criticizing this at all. I, I'm, I'm one of those people. But the point is I have the ability to do that because I have disposable income. So yeah, this, this whole narrative, this whole discourse of kind of trying to vote with our dollars, move a little bit away from the industrial food system. It would be healthier. I want to support my local farmer. It's tough to do if you don't have a lot of disposable income. Do you always have these huge issues where people always say, there's not enough food, there's not enough food. And I, I it's actually, the, the furthest from the truth because um, 
on a yearly basis, we produce enough food to feed the entire world. To say that we don't have enough food to feed the world is ridiculous. It's just who is privy to that food? Who has the privilege to get the food? Who has the money, the means, the transportation? There's a lot of issues that go into food insecurity and it's not just there's not enough food. No, there's enough food. The food just isn't being distributed in the correct way. Someone told me um, one day that, you know, there seems to be a lot of um, efforts around hunger, but it seems like nothing is happening. You know, and I'm like, well, nothing is happening because hunger is just one symptom of the larger problem of poverty. And until we, s we solve that, until we really move the needle in that underlying disease, you know, we're not going to solve hunger. So when I started in this work about 30 years ago now, um, we were pretty explicit in calling it hunger when people don't know where their next meal is coming from. And various bureaucrats and social scientists have tinkered with definitions and scientific indicators and the federal government settled on the term food insecurity to describe what we used to call being hungry or being at risk of hunger. In other capacities, various folks have tried to expand our understanding of the problem of people not having enough food by describing it as a community phenomenon instead of an individual phenomenon. Right? An individual person doesn't have two dimes to rub together and they're hungry, but a community that has a whole accessibility problem, um, where there's something sort of holistically wrong with the connection between the food supply and the food demand in that community has what was called for some years community food insecurity. I think it, it changes per environment and changes per city, changes per town because everybody is afflicted by different issues. There's a whole other set of physical and logistical barriers to people getting the food that they need. The most typical example is life in what we usually call a food desert. But for want of a better term, communities that don't have a grocery store and where, unless you have your own car, it's difficult, time-consuming, expensive to just do your food shopping. Now when you have like the home, Homewood, everybody in Homewood has to leave if they're going to go grocery shopping. You have to leave 15208. There's no doubt about it. And what that results in is all kinds of different ways of coping that different people use. Some people will cut into their food budget, already quite slim, to take a bus to the grocery store. Our bus system here is not fantastic. But when they've got a month's worth of groceries to come home, they'll reach into their food budget to take a jitney home. Um, because that's the only way they can physically get their groceries home and it costs them six bucks, eight bucks, ten bucks. That's less money they've got to spend on food. And that can be limiting, you know, um, quite daunting um, when you're already in survival mode, right? So you just want to get somewhere that you're able to get all the things that you need. It also means that they're shopping less frequently because of that expense. Um, and so one of the things, one of the choices you make when you shop less frequently is you buy less fresh food. You buy more processed food. That same choice happens if you depend on your nephew or your sister-in-law to drive you out to the, to the big suburban place where the prices are cheapest instead of maybe the, the nearest grocery store that might be, um, that might have more fresh food. But if you're going once a month, stocking up when the prices are lowest, using all your coupons for that particular place, those constrained choices that you're making also make it likely that you're gonna be using less fresh fruits and vegetables, less high quality food. If all you have uh, is, is access to convenience stores, liquor stores, uh, gas stations, things of this nature, then you don't really have anything um, uh, that would that would allow you to have that access and that would encourage you to eat more healthy, uh, to cook meals at home, as opposed to going out to eat, grabbing some fast food or something of that nature. So when, you know, we live and exist within 
these systems that are entrenched, I mean, they're not going anywhere. Um, so you do try to infuse other elements, agriculture, um, gardening, both on a macro and micro level, has the potential to, to be a game changer. You know, when you're looking at the political scene, you're looking at our educational, um, the incarceration piece, um, whew, it can be, you know, it just hurts your heart. It really hurts your heart um, to see all the inequities. But I say, you know, what helps me to get up the next day and do this work, to work on those inequities and in health disparities and incarceration specifically, um, is the hope that it can be better. And that I have to believe that, because if I don't have the hope, then I have nothing.